welcome to another episode of Idea Prov with your host, Mike Pedersen. Um, I have a really unique um, guest today that I met through some, a lot of collaboration and had give me some insights in what he does. And we just kind of hit it off from a conversational standpoint. So I want to bring him on the show and kind of pick his brain about a really unique topic. So um, his name is Joey Spooner. And so, Joey, how are you and how's life been for you today? Hey, Mike, I'm, I'm doing well, actually. Uh, enjoying some sunny weather here in Maryland. We're above freezing today. The snow is melting. Uh, I can go outside and walk on the ground and not step in snow. So I'm, I'm very blessed today. That's the biggest, awesomest thing right now. Uh, and so happy to be here and looking forward to talking with you about our discussion. Wonderful. Not a problem. Yeah. Um, so just to give everybody a little bit of background, you're up in Maryland, you know, give us a little give us a little rundown on you know what pays the bills and, and what you're like you know outside of work yeah so um outside of work uh, what's a blast it, it, i want to start there actually is because i love long distance bicycling so i love the idea of getting somewhere and just riding for hours and hours and some people are like that's just not normal i would agree with them it probably isn't uh but there are certain groups of people like myself who love it uh, and it's a great way to kind of relax and just let things go and right now with all the 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 stuff we're dealing with is staying at home or trying to isolate. This is such a great way to get out and be alone and yet do something physical. Yeah. So yeah, that's that and gardening. I'm preparing for a big garden this year. So uh, laying all the groundwork, you know, planning out how I'm gonna make something fun and not destroy me basically as a human being because it'll be too much work. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of managing that, that capacity equation for sure. Yeah. Um, it's it's interesting. Like a lot of sometimes when you get into that stuff, it really disconnects you from, um, I guess, from the the pain. I guess that, that people go through in, in traumatic times. It really helps like recenter and focus, which which is a massive help. Um, so, tell us a little bit about um, you in, in any other sense. Yeah. So. Um Married to a beautiful woman here who is a PhD in music history, and she teaches at a university not too far from where we live here in the D.C. area, right outside the D.C. area. And, um, you know, uh, let's see, I've been working for the past, since 2001, so I've seen, we're currently using like a video conferencing system, a, a system that you can hear voice. I was in a small business, a startup business, actually in 2001. That was my first job out of college that was building this kind of technology. So a lot of this now that's so exciting or new to people or really annoying to people, uh, I got to be annoyed by it and knew about it in the early 2000 time frame. And so it's kind of an interesting loop all the way around the circle around uh, what I've done with my career. And, um, you know, uh, I've been doing things like software development, working with teams, working with services. Um, and working with the federal government even at times to help them out. And so it's been a real fun journey for me in terms of what I can do from a, a skill set background. And so I have a background in like software development again, uh, process management to some degree, uh, humane ways of working is another kind of way to look at what I do. And um, really thinking about executives and kind of empathizing with them with what they're going through and trying to figure out how they get to where they are in organizations and trying to help them change over time. So um, that's kind of like the work side of things. Like I said, my wife's a great musician, actually. She sings, she knows music history, and she's an awesome cook in the house. Uh, she's our lunchtime cook. She's a cafeteria. And in, in the dinnertime time frame, I'm the guy who does all the cooking and, and whatnot. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a great place to be right now because um, thankfully we haven't been impacted negatively by COVID. So I, I count my blessings. And um, that's a little bit of what I do on the the family side, the, the non-work side is definitely hiking, biking, and then gardening coming up. Uh, and I, I tweet with some friends about gardening and they're like, do you really know how to garden? I'm like, I don't know, I'll try. <laughs> Wing it. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah improv it basically. So we're talking about, um, you know, some of the, some of the systems thinking and, and um, some of the software development, but I know that you, you do some other things on the side. So tell us a little bit about like the, the method and stuff that you, that you came up with. Actually, uh, to be thanks for the question, Mike. So, I never came up with the method. I want to be clear about that. I use the method and love the method. Uh, and there are a handful of people who came up with the method. Um, and what we're talking about here is the the Kanban method. So, this thing originated probably it's well known in the manufacturing space from Japan. But my gut tells me this stuff's been around longer than that. And the guys in the manufacturing space in Japan said, hey, look, let's use this over here to solve these problems. 
because uh, the idea of originality is really something I like to challenge a lot with people. But um, what happened was uh, in, in Japan around the post-World War II era, there was this need to really start to manufacture things with good quality. And there's a lot more to it than the simplistic way I'm about to describe it. But out of it came this need to visualize inventory. And it got really exciting in the U.S. because suddenly there was somebody who said, I need to visualize my inventory, visualize how much is in flow, where it actually becomes, you know, final product, i.e. cars or something else being made. And so we have to have a way to do that and, and be aware of it and then find ways to improve how we do the work that we're doing. So it's kind of a multifaceted problem. Um, and what came out of it was this idea of using what are called kanban in Japan, which are basically signals or buckets really to keep amounts of material in them. And when the buckets get low to a certain threshold, there's a signal that says, go fill that bucket up with more stuff, you know, but nuts and bolts type things. And so that idea got picked up around uh, late 2009 or eight, somewhere in that time frame, um, maybe a little bit before that by uh, a handful of people. And the initial person was David Anderson, from what I know of, and he was recommended to look at this through a guy named um, Don Reinerson. And so Don's uh, very much a manufacturing kind of guy in some ways, but very smart about flow, very smart about uh, how to do things in a really balanced way. And he has a lot of mathematics behind what he talks about and just what I almost want to say is good common sense, but I, I don't know enough about Don yet, but I have that feeling. Um, but Don influenced David to give it a try in one area inside what was uh, what you, you and I know as Microsoft Corporation. And he ran it as an experiment inside uh, one of Microsoft's areas and had some pretty good success with it. And it was like an early, early version of what we call the Kanban method. And so he took those concepts and went to what was called Corbis. Uh, it's a photo photography company that holds a lot of stock photography. And um, he did some work there with a couple of other people, uh, people like um, Troy McGinnis, um, uh, Darren Davis, uh, a guy named Dan Vicanti, uh, a lady named um, Domenica de Grandis, and maybe one other person. I always feel like I'm forgetting somebody from that group. But they kind of huddled around and started really taking this idea and twisting it and pulling it and molding it into something that was kind of interesting, which had a lot of concepts around visualization of knowledge work. And so all the ideas we have, right, like your show, Idea Prof, imagine taking all those things and visualizing that and putting it into some kind of workflow and then trying to get those ideas into reality. Now, oftentimes in knowledge work, that is, it seems pretty black and white, like, oh, it's really easy, we do this, this, and this. But as you get people together and form into teams and then get into an organization, it becomes really complex and really hard to do uh, in a way that's somewhat sustainable, reliable, predictable, and easy on the human body, right, mentally. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what this method does is it tries to help you use certain practices to get to those levels of stability, to get to those levels of orienting yourself like a service, right, to talk to customers and get to know your customers, even inside your own business. Like, I, I know you work for a company as well, like I do, and uh, imagine in saying, well, we never really talk to our customers. Well. That wouldn't be so great, right? You want to be able to talk to your customers, even if they're inside your business. So this evolved to that, to then eventually getting into more of a strategic realm now, uh, where it helps companies out with some level of strategy. So the, the Kanban method has gone from an individual perspective, kind of like what we just talked about prior to this show, mm -hmm. all the way through to more like you're really operating your business using a lot of the parts and pieces from this method. So it's grown up quite a bit over the past 10 years now. And um, it's even gotten its own little maturity model where it shows you how to grow up with the Kanban method. So you may start from somewhere really kind of early on as far as what you do, and you can manage the way you do uh, your work better more and more over time. In our space where we came from with the Kanban method, we had things like Scrum that are next to us. Uh, the uh, what are called the scaled agile framework kind of things. These are different tools that a lot of companies use to help themselves pick up the pace a bit in terms of how they get things done. That's maybe their first motivation. But over time, they find that managing this stuff is really the tricky part. And that's where we have the Kanban method. We say, you can do a lot of these things, but managing it's going to be really critical to making it successful. And we have our own tools as well. But um, that's an example of, of what it is, and that's kind of the history of the Kanban method. Today, it's used throughout the world, uh, physically by a lot of people like you, for example. I saw your mm -hmm. Kanban board, you flashed it for a second. Uh, and so then there's there are people who do it physically and there are people who do it digitally. I use it to run my family, actually. So my wife and I have all our little things and our little boards here in a digital format. So um, yeah, it's, it's a really practical way of staying on the same page without killing yourself. What I do find, uh, for those who are listening who are like, well, how do you use it for families? I put all my projects into my Kanban board for the house, all the things we want to do. 
And our conversations happen there digitally. And so when we're having dinner or after dinner, we rarely, if ever, talk about projects. So the conversations become more about how did your day go? What's going on in your life? What are you thinking about today? How are you feeling? Not so much like, well, we need to talk to the contractor about X or we need to go out and fix Y. It's like that's all handled it's sort of in a back end way. Uh, so a pro tip for those who have families who want to remove the project conversations from their day to day lives. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a very unique way to do it. And what I've found especially helpful with the combo method is um, the way it kind of connects people. So, you know, you talked about just not only like running the family, right? Um, but I'm also thinking in, in the work standpoint is oftentimes people may not see the same projects or the same tasks the same way, right? But when you all of a sudden yeah. you put it up all on the board and you see where it kind of falls and lands within, you know, individual priorities, business priorities, um, the life cycle of the project and stuff like that, everybody can kind of then in turn you know, equates on the same page. And so people aren't fighting over, you know, responsibilities and what they what they feel is important. It kind of levels the playing field there mm -hmm. um, and just makes for a lot more constructive dialogue going forward. Yeah, it's huge. In fact, uh, part of our, because I work for the Kanban University, actually, uh, recently I started working for them. And one of the key things we have in our materials that we try to tell people is, it's the conversation that's the most important thing, right? Collaboration is so important. And so a meaningful collaboration, a meaningful conversation is what comes out of this. Because before you didn't have a map, and now you do. And so when you're doing knowledge work, sometimes you don't have a map of the work. And well, where is it? Who's working on it? What are we doing with it? Is that still the most important thing? Did we forget about it? All those conversations happen a lot more easily because we're visualizing it. It's, it's such a huge deal. Okay, so now when we talk about um you know the Kanban method. It's it's really it can be challenging to learn a different way to approach things, right? And so that kind of brings us to you know our topic for today, which is how do we unlearn behaviors and devolve to better understand and create new systems and patterns for us to work and live, etc. Right. So the first kind of thought process when when we kind of constructed this for me was. I said, oftentimes we have, we kind of build these shortcuts in life to be able to make things go a little bit faster, right? Mm -hmm. And so over time, we learn these particular behaviors to save time, save space, save money, et cetera, et cetera. So is it just as, do you think it's just as easy as taking a step back and kind of looking at those processes and say, you know, can I work this in a different fashion, even though I've been doing it for so long? Yeah, you can. Uh, and I've seen people do that. Not often, but I have seen them have like moments in their lives. Uh, in the Kanban space, we call those punctuation points, but that's a little something I'll get into in a moment. But there, there definitely is a, an opportunity sometimes people take, like midlife crisis, which I, I feel like I'm approaching one in my life, where it's like I'm in the 40s and it's like suddenly like, holy crap, I'm on the, the tipping point of going in the other direction and now I'm counting down, not counting up. But um, you know, there's there's that reflective pinnacle that might happen sometimes. You go, wait a minute, what about this? Or what if I did this differently? And that can happen sometimes to people where they start to think critically about how they're behaving, maybe how they want to change a habit, uh, and maybe how they want to change what they're doing as far as how they're managing what they do. But then um, there's also a flip side to this, which is really worth mentioning, that I've, I've only started to really understand a little bit of myself. So. A lot of those shortcuts you're talking about, they just work, right? No need to change it. And one of two things typically happens that causes you to think more critically about them changing beyond the midlife crisis for me. <laughs> and even this midlife crisis, which I don't really have, but I like to fictitiously say that I do just for the illustration purposes, uh, total denial is the only way to do this. But um, what I have noticed is that there are two ways of something happening that cause you to reflect on, am I doing it right? And that kind of creates a devolution behavior to some degree. Uh, one which is very slow burning, which is like a slow devolution, is this uh, constant pressure put on you or put on your group, your family, your organization, where suddenly all the nasty habits come out and you see them every day and it stinks. Um, and you realize you can't keep doing it. For example, um, maybe uh, one form of devolution is my habit is to put everything into to-do list and I have my entire to-do list and I always get my to-do list done uh, by the end of the week, you know, come hell or high water, I'm gonna do it, right? And then slowly uh, things start to happen in your life. Your roof starts to leak. 
uh, or your business, uh, our line of credit is being called on. Uh oh. Uh, and we thought we had another six months to play with the line of credit. And suddenly the bank's saying, no, nope, we got to bring you back in. You got to pay some more on the loan. Uh, all those things put pressure on how you're going to perform and behave. And suddenly the shortcuts become almost deficits to how you behave. And in fact, they cause things to devolve. You can no longer keep that to-do list up anymore. You can't keep delivering the same way you were delivering. And suddenly you have to fall back on old habits and even in fact sacrifice some of the things you said yes to, some of the things you might have committed to, some of the ways that you wanted to do things that were actually theoretically healthy for you to do. And so that pressure really changes you in that way. But there's another type of pressure, which is more like an explosion. And in the Kanban space, we call that a punctuation point. Something has happened, and now we have to change how we're going to behave. COVID's a good example of that. Wham, it happens, but it doesn't happen like a big wham. It kind of builds up and suddenly, oh, we're not going back to work anymore. And we're not going back for a long time. And now we have to change how we're working. And now we have to change how we're doing things. So all those habits that you had suddenly devolve. Uh, and I've seen this happen in the corporate realm. We want to operate in this way, like we were talking about a few moments ago, um, this idea of really clean behavior. We're going to be very clean in what we do. We're going to be ABC in our processes. We're going to always do those ABC processes. And then reality pushes against those processes. And suddenly you start to fall down. And that's the devolution in my world, where you said you're going to do something, you were able to do it for a while, you felt good about life, and then your environment shifted on you. And, and, and I like to say the phrase, shift happens in that line, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah. boom, it's like, oh man. So this is where devolution almost has to happen, not by choice, but because of just the effect of pressure on the way you're working. You have to say, I have to give this up. I wouldn't want to, but I need to. So that's kind of how I see those two forms of just bad habits kind of showing up, uh, shortcuts showing up, and suddenly you're now forced to take a break and rethink things uh, a good bit. Yeah, you got you have to like take a step back because if if it's the in, internal pressure, which you know hopefully you have the luxury to be able to step back, um, yeah, you know internally and say, hey, this this isn't this isn't working. Like I have time to be able to to reevaluate either my business, my life, my family, my my uh, relationships, all of that kind of stuff, and be able to say, mm-hmm. you know, let me recalibrate and then move forward. Like that's a, that's a healthy healthy way to do it. Um, and then, like you said, other times it's COVID or whatever it is that yeah. has an external pressure. You know, it could be, you know, um, something happens with your right to work or your work itself, or you know, maybe you have a, a health issue that all of a sudden you just became, you know. Um, impactful on it. Oftentimes these things are connected, right? Health yeah. issues, you know, have people pressure put pressure on themselves. So, you know, you talked about um, when you in that first that first portion about having the ability to recognize all those different pressure factors. Um, and you can definitely see that it manifests itself in a couple of different ways, you know, health and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. how, how do you feel the the process flows or maybe should flow, you know, in an ideal scenario to where you can reevaluate and look at those um, those techniques and those patterns and those behaviors to kind of right size them. Like how, how, do, how do they how do they relate and balance, do you think? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, and I've, I have a good friend uh, and I won't say his full name, but his name is Van because uh, I don't want to reveal too much about it. But he actually shared something with me that blew my mind uh, and it still blows my mind because he exemplified something that I work with businesses to do. And I'm sure families do this, but I have not met a family until I met him. Uh, And he said that every year, he and his wife take a step back and just look at how they're behaving, what they're doing, all these different goals, and they reassess what they're doing and say, what can we change? Uh, And it's such a huge thing, it's such a huge signal uh, of of family care, self-care, those kinds of things. And those get lost under the pressure sometimes, or you can build them up over time. But this idea of saying, let's take a, a good kind of review of what we've done. How are we doing as a business or as a team or as an individual? Are we really getting to where we want to go or are we still doing what we've always done? Are the bad habits still there or are they less frequently there? Because you can't just flip a switch and suddenly change how you're doing things. It just doesn't happen. Every organization will try this at least once. It's the drug of drugs. Let's change how we're behaving and just you know uniformly go in a different direction. Uh, and the problem is it, bad habits just hang around. They, they're hard to change no matter how you want to do them. But taking a step back and reflecting, and I just had a conversation earlier this morning with um, 
some consultants in the Kanban space. We have this thing called the accredited Kanban consultant uh, credential. And one of the greatest things that came out of it was this uh, reminder of, oh, by the way, in higher education, they have this whole thing, this whole discipline called reflective writing. And uh, to me, it's fascinating because if you take a step back and you journal during events or when events happen, or you journal later, like every month, just put in the calendar, try to remind yourself and jot down a few things about how you're behaving. And if you're going in that right direction, it's a huge deal because over time it culminates into a pattern that you can see about how you might want to change, how you may want to move around. And it could build up into frustration, like, you know, I've really got to do something about it. And that's going to probably lead to a creative idea or two about how to maybe change it. But self-care is going to be so important in how you solve that problem because you have to care for uh, not just yourself, but also your team. And can I think about how do you make things sustainable where you're not going back into the same sort of uh, hole that you dig for yourself uh, every so often. And um, I guess that kind of is where I get to with this idea of um, kind of looking back and saying, how do you change? It's really a, a reflective feedback kind of mechanism. In, in the corporate space, you're going to have some data that goes with it. How long did it take us to get X and Y done? Because time is money in some cases with the business world. But in the family life, it's going to be like, am I shifting gears? Am I really building up my health, for example, physically or mentally in a good way? Uh, and in the family realm, it's harder to find it. I know families do it. And in the commercial space, it's a little bit more obvious, more evident as time goes on. Yeah, um, and, and the self-reflection is key. I know it takes. It's very difficult for often for for people to do because it yeah. can be it can be challenging, right? Like you're looking at yourself and you're finding faults. And to some people out there, it might be like, oh, I find faults in myself all the time. Yeah, but are you finding the right ones, like the really ones that are important that matter, <laughs> right? Uh, but I think. But what was coming up for me too is not only do you look internally, but I think it's also super healthy to see while you're taking that step back reach out to your closest network your closest people and mm. just say hey i'm doing a little bit of reflection how am i coming across in the world like what are, are there any gaps are there any any things that i could i could potentially be better at and that can help inform your you know your decisions as well you don't have to take them all but i'm also thinking about thinking about your your closest relationships with your team at work like oftentimes as a supervisor you can say hey team what, where am I missing? One, one of the things that I'm good at, how am I not helping you? You know, how am I, How can I relieve some problems for you? How can I open the doors to make us operate a little bit better? And they could say, hey, well, maybe you don't give us enough feedback on, on, a, on a, you know, a faster frequency. We could really appreciate that. Or I'm really looking to grow in this particular situation. Um, and that would be helpful. Um, so it, that that kind of stuff can be really helpful. You can do it in your personal life on some of your relationships as well. You know, talk with your spouse and, and just kind of check in, almost like a spring cleaning. You do it with your house, right? You get rid of all the old stuff after a year. Yeah. Um, do the same thing with, with almost like your relationships and your people. You know, talk with the wife, the spouse, whomever it might be, and be like, hey, I really want to check in to see how we're doing. Like, how am I doing as a person? Am I am I helping? And you know, is there is there ways that I can improve? Is there things that I could potentially get rid of? And that way, you can kind of holistically look at the picture um, in a fashion that could bring you more insights than you might not have had before. Yeah, and I I like where you're going with that, Mike, because I think one of the key issues that we run into, and I'm guilty of this. I was very much guilty of this as a young kid because I. I used to beat myself up a lot about how to behave or how to get better or just somehow force myself to do better. And as I've gotten older and gone through more challenges in life, uh, I've come to learn that part of self-care that really matters is being kind to yourself and just treating yourself like you'd want to be treated. And I think a lot of us may not do that as well as we want to. And um, what's so important about that is, is not so much the act of being kind to yourself, but allowing your brain to take a step back and go, it's okay. I can look at this and not freak out yeah, this is not so great, and that's okay, without being reactive, like, i got to fix it. Because part of our brains wants to fix every single problem that we see. <laughs> At least that's the case for me. <laughs> yeah, okay. I feel that. I feel that. Yeah, so I, I think that's, that's a key component of this, is that if you're going to do this kind of feedback, this kind of reflection, uh, you know, be kind to yourself. You know, not only write about the, oh, the things I could do to improve, but, you know, what do I appreciate? And like, what is good about what I've got right now? Why am I, you know, a little gratitude goes miles and miles along. And it's super important to have that, to share with other people about what you think of them, but also for yourself. And that can lead to a lot of good positive reflection around, yeah, I could improve here. How do I improve? Because oftentimes, what I have found, at least for me, when I'm working with people and teams, 
and organizational executives is that sometimes they get blocked by being so fixated on the criticality of the problem rather than taking a step back and saying, well, we're doing pretty good, but how could we improve? Let's think critically about this rather than being so critically focused on it. It's, it's a different kind of positioning of your mind. And it's a big difference that happens when you go in that other direction of saying, let's be thankful, let's be empathetic, and let's expand and explore critically thinking about how to solve a problem. Uh, it's a big difference there. And in the, in the world of where I work, those are the things that we call the cadences. Uh, and so it's thinking critically, very objectively. And that objectivity is tricky, tricky stuff to get to sometimes because uh, we all have egos, whether or not we want to admit to it, we got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, ego, the ego portion, it, it comes across in many different ways for a lot of people. And a lot of people just sometimes they never believe that they're wrong, sometimes that they never believe um, like they're doing it the best way, right? Yeah. Or this, this is the way somebody told me to do it. I was like, well, just because somebody told you to do it that way doesn't mean it's always the best. And it's okay to challenge at times those preconceived notions. Like there's nothing wrong with. Um, you don't even have to take a step back to just say when something doesn't feel right. Like, mm-hmm. are we missing something here? Um, you know, when you're asking, maybe you're asking about customers and you're making decisions without ever talking to a customer of your particular oh, yeah. good or service. Like, oh, that yeah. could be a really important part. But, you know, uh, you could be blinded by the fact that, oh, maybe I have 10, 15 years in the industry or I've been researching <laughs> it for the last, you know, X amount of time. Or, you know, I've talked to so many people before. Okay, that's true. However, you know, by challenging those assumptions, oftentimes that's where we get those insights that a lot of people aren't privy to. And that's where those conflicts kind of come from, good and bad, that can lead to pushing past some of those consistent, monotonous behaviors as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just a final thing to tag on here about this particular topic that fascinates me that you're bringing up, that just is it's somewhat, I think, better known in psychology, well known in psychology, but maybe not better known in society, but it's slowly building up now is this idea of biases and also how our brain works. And so the way we take in information typically comes through two different pathways, but usually the first pathway is gonna be like, what are we talking about? What's the concept? What are we gonna do? Like an example would be, you know, post COVID, driving back to work for the first time in a long time. How do I get to work again? What turns do I make? Oh, I kind of remember it, but I can't quite figure it out. I kind of have to sense my way through it again. I have to make a map maybe and get there. And over the past week or so, you'd say, okay, now I know it, I've got it to my head. And so the way we learn some complex things is what's called a system two kind of thing. It's, it's old school psychology, but still pretty applicable. And it's this idea of we have to interpret something that might be theoretical or just ABC kind of stuff. But over a while, it gets break, burned into our brain. And that becomes what's known as sort of a system one place. And that happens really fast. So all those old habits of 20 years are in that system one place where it's like, do this. I know exactly what to do. I can do it while having a conversation with somebody else. It's so ingrained into my brain. Um, and so that kind of, of mindset can really be tricky uh, when thinking about how to improve, how to change, because you're stuck in that system one world. But one guy who really did a great job of exposing it, and I've listened to his book on tape, well, Audible, uh, but I have not actually read it yet because it's so thick and fun probably to read, is a guy named Daniel Kahneman. And he wrote this whole idea of uh, how we think about things with bias in mind. So there is this, uh, like you were just talking about, there is this willingness to maybe say, let's take a step back and re-effect, evaluate our assumptions. But there's also biases that just naturally happen all the time. They're so sneaky. They're so frustratingly sneaky. That's the hard part. You'll do it and your spouse or your friend will say, you know, you did that, right? And you're like, oh man. And it's, it's so natural for your brain to go in that direction. But uh, he writes a lot of good things that he's, he did in his life. He's now, uh, I think, no longer alive. But he wrote a lot of good details on his experiments and what he learned to discover what was bias. And the experiments were so simple, but the bias was there. So I think part of it is, is, is starting to acknowledge that we have bias that we bring to the table, uh, as well as assumptions. And I'm guilty of both. I'm, I, I heavily invest in assumptions and don't tell people until after the fact. <laughs> and that's that's bad news, honestly. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, the bias was, was the next kind of phase that I was going to. So so yeah. you know i'm glad that you kind of brought that up because you know we kind of often we go into these modes where we just think some things are just automatically connected and it's not necessarily the case you know i mean the things it happens all the time and like you said it's so sneaky and and you don't do it you know, oftentimes you don't do it intentionally but yeah. it's just the way it naturally comes across you know like i'm just thinking of a, of a couple of ones you know off the top of my head like i don't know uh, like uh, for example all you know 
Indian food might be spicy. It's, like, it's not always the case, you know? <laughs> it's, it's just like some food can be tasty. And, and we make these assumptions and it's like, how do we rewrite that code in our head? You know, and the best, the best way that I've found to do it is, first of all, like you talked about, you have to acknowledge that that, that, that could be a bias, right? That could be a predisposition to think a certain way. And then I think the next yeah. step after that is you have to say, well, let me see if I can find a way to prove something opposite to that bias. That that's not necessarily the case. And it, and it starts out with really small steps, really small um, things like, for example, in food, like not all foods, not all of those types of foods might be spicy. So maybe you try and find one that's not and you're like, OK, that you're starting to think in a little bit of a different pattern. And hopefully that begins to capitalize on itself and, and trickle in other aspects. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think you make a good point there that, um, gosh, I, I learned this it, at some point, maybe 10 years ago in my life. I just told myself, be quiet, dummy. Because uh, you don't know it all. And you, with your biases, you kind of start walking and go, well, I know this is going to be. I know this is going to work. And your biases are kind of driving the conversation or the, the decision making for you. Uh, and even your assumptions, for sure. And what I've, what I've really uh, loved to do, and it came from my wife, actually, of all people. She said, you eat your food in a cereal fashion. You eat this part of the plate and this part of the plate and this part of the plate. And I'm like, yeah, I want to enjoy each thing separately. She's like, have you ever tried mixing it together? <laughs> And I was like, no, I would never do that. That's sacrilegious. And she's like, no, you should try having a little bit of this. Wait, try a little bit of that and enjoy the different contrasting flavors. And I was like, oh, all right. And now that's pretty much the thing I do. And then our conversation has evolved to, have you ever tried this kind of food? Well, no, I never would. Have you tried it before? No, I haven't. Okay, well, let me try it. And so she would be sort of the guinea pig. And if she liked it, I knew I probably would like it. So I, I started learning that if I tried new foods, there was a good chance I probably would like it. Uh, and I think that's the idea that we run into a lot in, in our lives, whether it's business or personal, is this idea of risk and our consideration of what risk is. Risk is abnormal. It's unexpected to what we expect, right? And so we have to have a sense of, are we willing to take a risk? Some people are great at it. They're unbelievably good at it. They're just like mind-blowingly good at it. Other people like where I came from are a little bit more hesitant. They, they want things to be really secure and safe, uh, but there's still a need to kind of take a risk because their friends around them are probably doing that and having a lot more interesting lives maybe or just uh, more aware of what risks really do look like. So I think the, the only way you can do that is through, effectively, if you're trying to get out of that, is to learn about it, but also experiment with it, right? That's such a huge deal. And I think people like me, for example, I came from a traditional science background. I was taught a lot of science, taught a lot about experimentation. So when I hear the word experiment, you know, I get that 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 animated GIF picture of that girl who's like sitting there kind of dazed and confused, like a weird face. There's all these mathematical symbols going around her head. That to me is what can be the danger zone of scientific method methodology, which can be misused, right? It's not that complex in reality. So it is more like what you just described, which is this idea of, well, I think this could be true. Let me go out and give it a try. And if I'm wrong, I'm willing to accept the risk of that being wrong. It's like going to an Indian restaurant and saying, well, I think the food's going to all be spicy, so I'm just going to try this dish. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Pleasantly wrong, perhaps. And sure enough, you get a dish like egg korma, which is nice and smooth and balanced and rich and delicious. And I could just go on talking about that dish. It's so good. Uh, and you just love it, right? It's your, it's your go-to food. And then you start to explore more. So I think there's that relationship that kicks in over time. And I'm still learning it. I'm nowhere near a guru. But there's definitely a a really valuable place where you can say, I don't feel insecure. I feel like I'm going to take a small risk. I know what I'm going to do to kind of manage that risk and come back and evaluate it by trying out something new. Uh, and that's where that, you know, you devolve and then you evolve, right? You devolve from pressure. You have to evolve from a place of somewhat confidence around risk and how you want to play with it a little bit. So speaking of that element of, of risk that we were talking about, it's, it's really good to, to, to focus on that on the individual because I think that'd be super helpful um, for people to improve their lives, right? Mm -hmm. um, but to take a little bit of a wider lens on this, how can, you know, maybe systems, organizations, you know, government, politics, look at unlearning some of their past behaviors that might improve life for, you know, large amounts of people. I mean, this is a really big, you know, topic or conversation, but, you know, the, the first thing that I'm looking at is looking at the public works of life. So maybe, 
you know, uh, water, electricity, yeah. and stuff like that, and really looking at those and said, hey, these are the basic needs. What are the assumptions? Okay, yes, people need it, but how are they interacting with the systems? How are they interacting, whether it's paying their bills or getting them? When we have a really huge you know, crisis going on with the electric electricity and power grid in, in Texas and stuff like that, where things have failed, you know, where are these opportunities in which we can kind of look at that and say, hey, let's let's unlearn what we thought was right to build a better product in the future. Well, and, and this is kind of fascinating to me because, um, boy, this is a good one. So I, I think when it comes to unlearning, it really is about feedback that triggers the need to think about things more critically to then kind of unlearn or change what you're doing to some degree, uh, unlearn those bad habits. And in an individual level, it's almost like a bias or an implied uh, habit that kind of kicks in. And that's almost what I would call an implied sort of policy. Like, how are you going to treat yourself? Uh, how are you going to get ready in the morning? Uh, what are you going to do as far as interacting? How do you communicate with people? Those are kind of built-in policies that run our body and our brain. Um, and to kind of tie back to some of this experimentation as a way to get around or evolve in some ways after devolving or breaking away from where you are, it's really exciting to me because, um, you know, you were, we were talking about the energy thing a little bit just then. And, you know, lately the, the hot topic is the, the state of Texas and that they're independent mostly with their power grid. And how did they get there? And I don't know the whole story to it, but I know of one particular little slice of it, which really kind of makes me go. hmm. And one way, a little part of Texas, I think it's called. Um, oh, goodness gracious. Hill Country is what it's called, that area. And the only reason I know it is because I'm fascinated with barbecue. I love barbecue. And there's this area in D.C. called Hill Country Barbecue, which is pretty good barbecue. I mean, uh, my friends who are listening who are from D.C. might be like, no, no, no. But really, it's one of the places that I like to go to. It's actually got pretty decent barbecue. Um, but the thing about it is uh, Hill Country, Texas, is where uh, Lyndon B. Johnson was from, uh, one of our presidents. And before he was president, he was leader of the Senate. And before he was leader of the Senate, he was, I believe, a senator, obviously. And one of the things he did when he was young in his tenure there uh, was to lobby Franklin Roosevelt. So before World War II, uh, I think it was around this time that uh, Johnson knew he did not have electricity where he lived. He knew how powerful that was. Like an electric generation utility was not existent in that area of Texas. And so What's interesting about this is you have um, Franklin Roosevelt running multiple experiences at this time, uh, experiments at this time. He's running experiments all left and right to try and recover from the depression. Every little thing he's trying out, if it doesn't work, he gets rid of it. If it works, he holds on to it and tries to expand it and scale it, right? And um, here you have uh, LBJ coming along and he, he says, I need power down here. And so they work out a deal uh, and eventually get power down there in Hill Country. But again, this is provided through policy, policy made by a group of people saying we need to fund this thing over here uh, and we need to get this done right over here. So they start to recognize that with policy, that provides some sense of effort and energy. And that's what gives effectively, literally power to that area of Texas. How it evolves into a independent grid after that, I'm not privy, not aware of it, but I think that is again through policy. Because if you look at some of how uh, people present Texas in some ways, they may say, we want to break away from the rest of the federal government. We want less regulation. So policy is less oversight. Uh, and so I think when we talk about public goods, it's about feedback and responding to that feedback. And perhaps, I would assume, that a majority of people in Texas at one point in time said, we don't want so much oversight. It's just going to kill us. Too much money spent oversight, too many taxes. Let's reduce that. Let's make it easier on ourselves. And so the policies really do kind of change how things happen, how things behave differently. And so when you're thinking about larger systems, bigger systems, that's kind of the big chunky piece of this. It's kind of tricky uh, because you have to figure out how to experiment with policies without maybe making them so broad initially. So the idea of innovation or isolation through innovation is a really cool key concept to try out where you do little experiments here and there to see what works out. El uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt was doing this uh, and probably had a good idea that he was actually doing this. He was saying, let me try it over here. Let me try it over there. And if it really works well, let me make it into something bigger. And, and that's kind of how policies really affect the idea of systems and how systems get put together over time. Uh, sometimes they come out of that punctuation point kind of thing, like I said earlier. Um, you know, there's the uh, 
the credit card crisis or the financial crisis of 2008 or right around that time. And we had the Center for Bureau, um, I think it was called the Center for Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. There we are, acronym suit completed today. Uh, but that, that is something where that evolved out of a punctuation point kind of moment where so many people were in crisis financially. Uh, whereas you, you end up in another kind of crisis and suddenly there are more policies that are needed to help things evolve in a healthy way. So you can devolve, like we just talked about, two different crises. One is this depression era crisis that happened where experimentation was needed. Another one is this financial crisis that happened later on in 2008, which then generated this need for some kind of bureau to help manage policies or instigate policies on behalf of the federal government, depending on who makes those policies. So a lot of systems evolve out of a need to control in some way through policy and influence healthy behavior that way. Yeah, the, the policy, and especially those little tests, um, if people can get on the same on the same page, right? So whether it's tests in states, city, local level, all the way up to the federal level can be super impactful. But I think another thing that was resonating as you were, you were talking was the ability to um, be very careful how we look at data in this framework, right? Um, because I think when, it, when you start talking about sometimes the policies and what people create, in addition to that, people could have some preconceived notions, preconceived beliefs um, about certain parts of the United States or certain parts of the world, certain um, you know demographic groups, certain ages, certain genders. And of course that can help dictate their thoughts, beliefs, um, and the way they construct things, you know, including those biases that we talked about as well. Um, so I think you have to, we have to also look at the data and what's telling us. So, you know, common things like the census that comes out every 10 years, making sure people can fill those out. So, because there's so much that is based on that raw data, whether it's uh, educational funding for your local schools, whether it's the funding that goes into your civil governments. Um, and these are everything that everybody deals with, right? Public roads, public relations, um, community projects, libraries, you name it. And so having that data to be able to look at can say, hey, let's let's actually get the data first before we potentially look at the policies and stuff like that and then make them accordingly. Um, because if not, then you start, you're just, you're going off of what you think and what you believe. And so if you devolve and kind of take a step back and say, hey, listen, maybe that maybe that information that we have may be a little dated. It could be 10 years old, 15 years old. It could be just something that I had in my head from somebody that told it to me, you know, last week. Let's actually go get the real accurate stuff to be able to move forward with and iterate on for those policies and those changes. Yeah, and that's a, a really cool thought because one of the things I see happening slowly in our, our lives, which <clears throat> maybe will happen more frequently, but um, it's really cool because I think more and more we're appreciating the value of feedback uh, and knowing how to handle feedback. Whereas before it was the idea of, well, feedback may or may not be valuable. I mean, not that people said it was invaluable, but there may not be interest. And, and now I think maybe with some of the government agencies I've seen, they're starting to pick up a, their ears and listen more critically. I mean, obviously you have the census, which would then feed into legislative activities, funding activities, that kind of stuff, but, or congressional, I should say, activities. But the, the thing I'm noticing now more and more is that uh, companies are trying to listen more and more to their customers, and so are government agencies to some degree saying, we're here, we're funded, are we actually meeting some level of expectation? That's not easy to do, but it can be done. Uh, for example, the CFPD, CFPB I gave you an example of, they actually do a good bit of feedback loops and they do check to say, did we resolve it? Did we hand it off right? So there is a good a bit uh, of accountability for service, which I think is a huge deal. Uh, and that goes back to setting up systems that are really what we call in the Kanban space, service oriented. It's like, we know who our customers are, and we know the archetype of our customer, we know how to engage with them. They're telling us if we're fit for their purpose or not. Uh, and if we're really getting in the right place. So that's a, that's a big deal because like you said, a lot of times you can have expert thinkers, expert gurus who say, well, this is how you should do it. And then, okay, well, we're gonna go do it. And in my field, that can be really big consulting firms that really are smart by the way. They're not dumb by any means, but they may say, this is how you do it. And then someone takes that in, biases it, assumes it. And then suddenly here we are with this sort of like fixated way of doing things. Uh, whether that's federal or commercial or whatever. So it's really kind of, I think, important to take a step back, like you said, and reassess where you are using that feedback. 
And feedback, like we were just talking about, it can come in two different forms, and it's so important to remember this. One form is we know who we're talking to. We can get feedback from them saying, are we going in the right direction? The other kind of feedback is we don't know what to do. We're completely clueless with all of this. Let's try something. And the feedback from that trying of something is just as important, which could be from people. It could be from systems. You don't know. That's the, it depends on your context, really. That's the fun part of the problem. Um, but yeah, I, I think that that's a huge piece is that looping back and knowing uh, kind of if you're going in the right direction or not. Uh, and I think the most critical part is tuning that relative to your context, because a lot of people are given recipes for how to do this in my world. And I, I fear for them because those recipes work for only so long. It's like we were just talking about with the Indian food. It's like, well, this is, I love the egg korma. I love the egg korma. Well, you get the egg korma every Thursday. Uh, so at some point it becomes kind of boring, right? And you may not be picking up on change around your own needs, or in this case, uh, maybe the company only sells egg korma on Thursdays because egg korma has been so popular. But there's another Indian company that makes good food next door, and suddenly they start to sell egg korma and like really good naan, for example, like a good garlic naan. Yeah, there we are. So let's like say they're going to start selling a garlic naan, and people go, whoa, that's even better. And that company that's selling that garlic naan starts to listen to their customers and sense their preferences, they may offer up a tandoori chicken or something else like that, right? That becomes a way of evolving by listening to that customer, by getting that feedback. And the same thing can happen in services as well. You can actually give surveys. You can go back and look at the frequency in which they're asking for things. You can look at the seasonality patterns. Those are kinds of things that tell you more and more uh, if you're going in the right direction and meeting those demands successfully or if you're not. And again, a lot of this is derived by how you set up policies for how you handle these things. Uh, so that's kind of the connectivity that comes together with some of these systems that I, at least I deal with. My friends who are listening to this, who do deal with systems thinking or government, my apologies. I am not a guru. I, I will openly admit that right now. I'm, I'm systems curious, Kanban curious, and dangerous with that knowledge. Yeah, it's like right at that, right at that <laughs> precipice of tuning that feedback to the context right. is, is exactly what you're talking about. And I think... Um, you really kind of spoken to the heart of the show and why I'm, why I'm doing it in, in regards to kind of designing those services, right? Designing those services, like, mm. and that's, that's what I do. I'm a service designer. And so I look at all the different things as a holistic level and, and pull out those insights and say, hey, well, maybe we need to tweak this. We need to cut, you know, check in with your customer here, do some research here and, you know, try these little experiments. Yeah. So I think that's a perfect way to kind of wrap up um, our little kind of talk today. Um, so I want to highlight a couple of um, key takeaways from our conversation um, and see if I missed anything. So okay. when we talk about devolving and moving into a better understanding and create better systems and patterns, a couple of things you know, from a high level that we want to take a look at is we want to make sure that we are understanding our problem and framing it accordingly. So expecting things to change, you know, they come in two different forms, whether it's, you know, pressure um, on your internal pressure where things no longer look like they're, they're, you know, working out or an external force that you have no idea about. A second step is, you know, taking a step back and seeing if you can try and reflect and make things sustainable in a fashion that, you know, you can, you can do on a regular basis evaluating how you change and how you're taking you know an approach to it you want to make sure to evaluate your risk as it's as it's willing to going forward in those assumptions as well you want to take a look at your feedback and creating feedback loops and look at the big picture side of things um, you know try out little experiments get feedback on it and be able to iterate on that process we want to look at the policies that we create and the data that we assume or that we take in to be able to look at things at a more holistic level and make accurate you know, experiments to be able to iterate on. Um, but at the same time, we have to appreciate our victories and make sure that you mm -hmm. know not everything that we're doing is horrible and bad and then but at the same time challenge our norms in those um, in those situations as well. Anything that I missed? I think you hit it really well. I think the, the important thing is, is to, to recognize 
Yeah, the, the most important thing out of all of this is to take a step back and just be thankful for what you have because you have enough of a life to actually solve a problem like this, whatever that problem might be. And that's a good place to be. Um, so it's, it's going to take, yeah, it takes a lot of good reflection to get to where you want to go in the long run and thinking creatively. And so I, th I think you hit a lot of those key issues right there, uh, solutions for how to solve these problems, how to look at evolution in kind of a unique way. Um, and, and I hate to say it, but the one thing I've got to my left is about 200 books to read. On the right side of me is about 50 or 60 books I've read, and I'm a big fan of reading. So if there's one thing I've learned is that you wanna keep building that learning muscle uh, while you're doing all of this. Expose yourself to new things. I'm fortunate enough to be married to musicians, so there are nights where I do nothing but listen to really amazing music I've never heard. So always try to expose yourself to something new so your brain's a little bit more plastic when you come into problems like this, when you're thinking about how to deal with devolving or how to deal with evolving uh, systems, for sure. Yeah, it's, it's that learning something new. Um, and that's just, it just comes from just being curious, right? Like jump into a space which you have no idea about, even if you think that you might not like it, and just assume that you're a child poking around, having fun, you know, figuring things out, because all of a sudden there's a whole realm of kind of possibilities that open up. Um, to you when you start doing that and operating in that fashion whether it's books um, whether it's podcasts you know plug for this one you know because that's what i try and do on here yeah. <laughs> um, whether it's audiobooks yeah. like you talked about before you know whatever medium it is just find a way to continually learn that muscle and your, your mind will take you to some some really cool places well yeah i think we got a lot of great um insights and conversation there so um joey i have to i have to thank you like i, I was just saying the, you know the amount of content that that i've been able to get and share with people i mean we got easily six seven items here and so um thank you for the time to to you know pick your brain and, and share all of your knowledge i think a lot of people get some really good value from it in the way that they can kind of unlearn behaviors and and explore that topic yeah, thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me here. This has been a blast. I love talking about this stuff. Uh, like I said, I'm still a beginning learner in some ways, but happy to share with what I, what little I know, so to speak. And, um, you know, little plug like you for your uh, podcast. I, I work for an organization called Kanban University. So if people want to learn more about how to do this kind of stuff in their business, we've done it a lot for a lot of big companies and small companies as well. So uh, happy to share more about how you do that inside your business so that you can stay sane and not... Uh, lose your minds with too many things at once um but yeah thanks for having me here this has been fun you know i don't get to talk that much about devolution of people and how that's actually sometimes a positive thing you feel like you're sliding down a hill but in reality you just get ready you're going to hit you know what people refer to as rock bottom but you're going to hit bottom at some point and be able to go from there and really change how you're doing so that learning process is continuous and i really uh encourage people to try that more and more and and not resist what changes coming at them yeah, I mean, so, it's it's, yeah. it's fantastic. And not only can you use, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about on, on a big scale, but then on the personal lives, like like you brought up with, with mm -hmm. using it, at, you know, whether it's Kanban, using it at home with your families and stuff like that. So absolutely, we'll put in all the information um, so uh, for, for the Kanban University so people can kind of get equipped there and then reach out to, to you or whomever it is that, that will probably be the best representative um, for that yeah. going forward. So with that, um, thank you all of our listeners for, for your time and attention today. We really hope to uh, continue the conversation as well on ideaprob.live. If you have any comments from there, you can see the blog post up in a couple of days. Um, and then stay tuned after the break for our Idea Prob Insight. So I wanted to share with you a new idea problem inside. It's an innovative skylight that actually is a hand-pumped seawater solar desal desalination skylight. So you pump seawater into it. The sun uses its rays to heat it up and through desalinization creates fresh drinking water. And then the residual salt brine is used to power batteries for light inside. So this was part of the Lexus Design Award for 2021. Um, that has been in its ninth year, so it can be used in you know plenty of developing countries as a way to not only uh, kind of create another use for electricity, but then also create fresh drinking water as well. So I thought I would share, and I'll definitely put a link in the comments so that way you can check it out. Until next time. Mm -hmm.